what should you call this new science that we are also fond of? Analytics, should we call it data mining, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. I think I prefer to call it machine learning because artificial intelligence is too much of a hype. Someday we'll get there, but not quite. Okay? Um, I want you to know that um, I am passionate about the R programming language, and every morning I wake up at 4 o'clock and spend 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock doing something or the other with it. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, the, as a historical context, it, it is important to know, you know, that it's very important to know that in quick glance in history how technology affects society. So AI and machine learning will not be different. When the textile industrial revolution that all of us have read about happened in the late um, 18th century, uh, typically you had a factory system. The plus point was affordable clothing. The minus point was child labor, labor, urban blight, and so on. You know, and Marx, I think, was the one who put all that in perspective. When steel, rail, and ships came about, the plus point is affordable transport, world trade. The negative point was slave trade, and it aided colonialism in some ways. When electricity and auto and petroleum came, I think it meant affordable clothes, you know, polyester, etc., uh, nylon, polypropylene. But the negative was, um, uh, you know, collapse in Bengal, jute mills, naxalism, Bombay uh, textile mill strike, and so on. And I'll have a little more to say about it in a minute. Um, in, when computers and internet has come along, affordable healthcare, insurance, etc. But many, many jobs are starting to disappear. Middle class jobs are going to disappear. Now, this is something which. You know, I also uh, I saw a number of Bengali names in the cards, so I have a quick question, which is, what is, what is the cause of, uh, for example, naxalism? And everyone blames, uh, you know, various things and so on. The core issue was, somewhere in the 1950s, uh, synthetic textiles got invented. When that happened, for example, nylon stockings got in, it was the first, you know, invention by DuPont. Uh, when I came to Bombay in 1971, after finishing my IIM at Calcutta, there were 120 textile mills doing very well in this whole area, from uh, you know, from Churchgate to here. Um, within eight to ten years, all had gone. They all died, and uh, most people, if you ask them what happened, they'll say that the summoned, uh, you know, labor union problems. I once went and met Mr. Podar, who's still alive, who ran Podar Mills. He's in his 90s, and I had, I love talking to him because he has so many, you know, sto anecdotes of that era. He even today believes it is trade unionism. But the core of it was that when polyester got invented, uh, our Bombay textile mills, which did cotton, had no answer. And I remember a time, and again in the 60s, my sister refused to go to college. My, my parents bought her a nylon sari. But she said, you know, who wants to be old-fashioned to wear cotton saris and go? People won't respect me in my college. And all of us wore polyester trousers and shirts. That destroyed the mills. And what is more interesting is most people in, in Bengal think that Naxalism is uh, Charu Sanyal and all those guys. But the core of it is 40 to 45% of Bengal, in one way or the other, owed its livelihood to jute. Either growing it or jute mills. And with the advent of polypropylene, and Jute's main business was to export business to the UK and USA, where they used as carpet bankings. When polypropylene was invented, that whole thing collapsed in a period of 10 years. And that is the origin of the, the kind of agitational thing which set out in Bengal, which lasts even today in some ways. You know? So it is very important to understand that when technological change comes, it has a lot of benefits. Things become cheaper, etc. But it has some societal impact, and this is true for uh, what I call, you know, deep learning and uh, machine intelligence. Um, so it's very important. Now you can see, since many of you are in the fintech environment already, there is something similar to what I just recounted, like probably properly in happening. These are the type of. This is uh, this is about outdated by about a year and a half, but nonetheless, the amount of things. The whole banking, insurance, vertically integrated system is now in the process of being disaggregated. It's being disaggregated into pieces. 
there are lending banks and there are, you know, payment banks and all kinds of things are happening. And I keep wondering and tell my friends, all my friends who run these big financial systems, will BKC, Kurla, Bombay, what is it called, the Bandra Kurla complex look soon in another 10 years like uh, what we look at Peril. All those grand buildings, it's worth thinking about. And I'm just joking. Uh, now it's very important to think that through. Um, I know, uh, this is just a recitation before I get on to my thinking. Uh, these are, you know that currently machine learning is underway and if you are in a financial company, these are the areas that you are already working on. Algorithmic trading, predictive analytics, fraud detection and prevention, marketing, targeting, and of course, chatbots and customer support. This is underway, so this is a basic entry point, but more things are going to happen soon. Uh, here is a slide borrowed from McKinsey as to when the internet comes, not just machine learning, when the internet has arrived, three different forces are underway here. One is called disintermediation. In other words, what Amazon does is disintermediation, instead of somebody importing a file, a, a product, uh, let's say a mobile phone, as a wholesaler giving to a regional distributor and to a retailer, they are cutting the chain from the manufacturer right up to the end consumer. That is disintermediation. So some of that is going to happen in the financial world as well. Uh, the second is disaggregation. What used to be, let's say, a, a, a newspaper uh, where first the, you know, the classified ads got split off and within classified ads, the job ads got split off. It's today, the, and, and today there are content companies, there are classified ad companies and all kinds of things going on. So that disaggregation will also happen. The vertically integrated bank that we all think and see is a big question mark. And we'll have to really think very hard to see where that is going to go. And finally, dematerialization. Uh, there was a time we all used to go to Rhythm House and buy nice LPs and, you know, or CDs. Uh, now you download it. The whole business is gone. And there was a very historic event when uh, Rhythm House finally shut shop about three, four years ago. I, I went and stood in front of it, and I must say tears came to my eyes, because that's the place you all go and get wonderful music for a long time. Now, this, this you must watch very carefully and study the businesses that you're in, because all three forces are underway. And I can see it happening uh, much more in New York and a little about India is normally about four or five years behind in some of these things, but not much more. Um, okay, now, uh, since you are trying to see what you can do best, uh, in machine learning, I would urge you to jump over the, uh, you know, don't just use these algorithms as, as a dogma. Please dive deep and see that there are types of machine learning, there's supervised machine learning where you say, I have this 100,000 observations which is manually cutered to say this is a fraud and this is not a fraud. And then you discover a model underlying it and apply it to an unlabeled thing saying that I can predict who is going to be a fraudulent. So that is supervised learning. Uh, there is unsupervised learning where you don't know. You just have a piece of data and you must guess what is a fraudulent transaction. And reinforcement learning is what I think today we call neural networks and so on. They have their own ways of doing things. In supervised learning, uh, please dive deep, and this is more for students than for the practitioners. You probably know all this. The classic algorithms are, you know, GLM and support vector machines and things of that kind. In clustering, which is a form of unsupervised learning, uh, there are k-means decision trees. I'm sure you tried that. And in reinforcement learning is where the maximum excitement is today uh, through neural networks. Again. Uh, one of the negative things about the statistical machine learning community is they have given brain-like metaphors, say, neural networks, neural nodes. Uh, it's nothing of the kind. They are statistical algorithms. They operate in a chain, but there's no connection whatsoever to the brain. No connection at all. If you take it from me. Uh, and, but reinforcement learning is when uh, uh, you don't even know, you don't need to tell the machine uh, what the features are and the features are not classified into continuous versus etc uh, etc et the algorithm can take the features as it comes with you and do all those steps of you know classifying the variables uh, normalizing it standardizing it removing the outliers etc 
the reason which in the supervised and unsupervised categories, you have to do all of that manually. So the excitement about uh, reinforcement learning is that at the moment, uh, and I play a lot with it, it, it looks as if it takes away the, the, the hard labor in the early stages which the other two techniques used to have. Also, I would urge you to again dive deep into the algorithms and see some of these big issues. There is something, every piece of data has something called bias and there is something called variance. It's very, very important to know that if you don't do the right algorithm, you will overfit to the current data and when a new data comes in, you will be off the mark. Similarly, there is underfitting when the underlying data has high bias. So it is very important to strike the right balance. Look deep at your data and see which has bias and which is uh, high variance. What's the trade-off that you can do between us? So it is, not, uh, it is not a routine job. It is almost like you're an ace cricketer. When a ball comes in, you must decide, what can I do? Is it short of length? <laughs> is it full of length? If it's short of length, I can try a sweep. But if it's over pitch, I can't try a sweep. I lose my wicket. So there is a lot of a time when you dive deep into it and uh, the science becomes an art because you need to judge which will work and which will not work. So I'm urging the young people in this audience to open your mind of curiosity and figure out um, is it a high variance data? Will I be problem of overfitting? Is it a high bias data? So the ability to jump high variance and high bias and all that is very, very important and acquired through practice. Okay? This is a simple example of a neural network that I was playing with a couple of weeks ago. This is an attempt to predict, uh, you know, final delivery. One of the issues, um, we were the pioneers and Rita was the earliest player in online shopping, but we just kind of backed off because that's just too much bloodletting going on there. Uh, but I play around with the algorithm because out of 100 orders in India, 70 to 80 are for cash on delivery. So you need to predict if this chap has ordered, is he likely to take it? Because sometimes he says, I've changed my mind, I don't want it. And returns in India are 40%. That you can incur huge losses. So I was playing with an algorithm which can, through, you know, through a neural network, see whether given, you know, who's the person, what's he done with us before, what is the location, uh, what is the geotag that his place has, what is the price of the goods, which is the vendor who's supplying, predicting. It comes, you can get results at 99% accuracy. So these are the kind of prediction jobs that neural networks are very good at. Hmm? Um, uh, the second area which is very exciting, which I think I would urge all of you to dive deep in, is called word vectorization. Now, if you see the basic breakthrough in chemistry, which led to the creation of, uh, you know, indigo, and indigo, the discovery of indigo is what led to, you know, uh, a great amount of benefits for people. Uh, in, in, incidentally, indigo is the reason why the Champaran agitation took place. I forgot to mention that. Gandhiji became a big, Gandhiji was a lawyer practicing in Bombay. Okay, and a member of the Indian Merchant Sabre, which I am also a member of. He saw the political opportunity when the Champaran peasants in Bihar had a problem. They shouted their British colonialists are exploiting us, etc. About the underlying issues, five to eight years before that, indigo, with what the Champaran peasants uh, grew, uh, had been synthesized. The price of indigo in the international market fell from a unit of 100 rupees something to one one hundredth of the price. So obviously the local indigo growers had no hope. So it's not the Brits, the wicked Brits who created the problem. It is a, the, the, the benzene ring was, which solved the problem and indigo could be synthesized. Similarly, something is happening in the world today which is equally important, something called word to wick. I met some young people who are already experimenting with it. You should tr try word vectorization which allows, once you vectorize uh, uh, some words in a document, you can do almost mathematical operations with text, as I've shown today, king minus man plus woman is queen. In other words, from a king, you take away the man side of it and add the, the sex to it, then you still keep the royalty intact and you become queen. So when you word vectorize it, you can do wonderful analysis on plain text. In plain text, you know, so you can, with the 
you can predict almost immediately what Mamta Banerjee is going to say and what uh, uh, my CPM friend in Kerala uh, was going to say. Uh, almost predict because the word vectors are the real breakthrough and most of the world's uh, knowledge is kept in text, yeah? contrary to what we think. And uh, please look at word vectorization and become adept at it because there are some big things which is happening in that world. Uh, the other thing is that all remember that once upon a time you build organization by vertical integration. So if you're a, um, somebody who started a small lending operation, you acquire somebody who has a deposit thing and the payment thing is you're now a full bank. That won't work anymore. Okay, today the world is being organized it were across networks. And I think uh, Uber and Ola are examples of it. There are many others. Uh, what it really means that if you are, uh, you know, in the non, um, these have network effects. Okay, you take this non-network effects if there is marine drive, and the more cars which pass on it, the more difficult it becomes to drive. Okay, so that is the old economies of scale type industrial economy. Whereas if you have a Ola Uber type system, the more drivers sign up for them, the better it is for you as a user to get uh, a taxi when you call. That is called a network effect. So the real issue is think through any business, look at how can I create network effects inside this. You know, so that's a very fundamental change which has happened. Unfortunately, not taught in colleges and even in the most uh, cutting edge management schools. The related thing is there's a number of algorithms which allow you to look at the world as networks. Earlier you used to do org charts. I think experiment with it. There are some examples here. I think there are an example on uh, a lot in uh, protein interaction networks, you know, the biotech area. There's some in knowledge graphs, you know, uh, and some inside here in, uh, you know, the uh, papers which are accepted in uh, academic papers. There's a pattern across who, what get accepted. And new thinkings like, uh, you know, node degree, degree centrality, hub score, activity score. It, these concepts are being brought to look at things. For example, we could do a look at all the people who are trading in the Bombay Stock Exchange or the NSC and detect patterns and you'll see some wonderful insights inside there. I wish I had the time to do it and I would have done it. You'll see what's really going on inside there. Okay? Uh, the other, I think, uh, just remember one thing, while all this AI is coming and many of my banker friends are saying I'm going to use it to, you know, to give a loan and not give a loan, legislation is soon coming. Uh, I didn't tell you that I was a person in the Indian IT Act section on intermediaries. I wrote it myself. I was a member of the committee so <laughs> long ago. Uh, and similarly, they have been calling me to say, in the United States, there's a big movement saying, if you apply for a loan to, let's say, Citibank in New York, and you live in Brooklyn, uh, if it gets, your loan gets rejected, you have to print out the equation with its weighted saying, why have you rejected it? Legislation is about to come in the United States. The reason being, some of these AI machine learning techniques can build on current biases. For example, if you live in a certain part of Brooklyn, which is largely black and poor blacks, if you happen to be a temporary resident there, because the algorithm gives a high weightage to the geolocation, it will reject you. Okay? And we have they have discovered that I was part of a conference the other day, in New York, where if you're a black, there's a high chance of you getting rejected because the simple algorithm, they call it machine learning and RTAI, etc. The algorithm has figured out people who are black are largely poor and <laughs> consequently rejected. So legislation coming saying, tell us, print out your algorithm and give us the reason why. In this example that I get, you're asked to identify a picture of a cat or a dog you say, oh, it's a black box and my algorithm says it's a cat. But you must say why. For example, cats have whiskers, pigs have whiskers, cats have claws, so pigs I don't have claws, cats have fur and pig doesn't have fur. So consequently, this is the reason I'm saying it's a cat. So this is legislation is about to come. First in the United States, it'll come here too, saying if you reject a loan or you say something is a fraud, a likely fraud, you print out the reasons why and that you have to give to the person. You can't say, oh, my algorithm says you won't repay my loan. Yeah? 
Uh, so I think when you are going to experiment uh, with uh, machine learning, here are some choices that you have. You can go to a cloud-based provider, okay, or you can do it on your own on your PC. Uh, if you go to a cloud-based provider, it's relatively cheap. Uh, you can, there is Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, Google Cloud. These are services you can buy on a per hour basis. You can either use their pre-trained models so or you can build your own models. Um, On-site, individually or in work group. For example, what I do, I, I have all those things, but I very often, uh, because my time, free time is when I fly from Bombay to Delhi to work on some government committee, and the two hours is what I have free time to do, and I can't get to the cloud during the time. So I carry a little PC around me, and uh, a PC with a GPU, a graphic processing unit, uh, from NVIDIA and things of that kind, or Windows 10 with R or Python. My personal choice is on-site individual PC with GPU. Uh, there's Microsoft uh, PC, which about, costs about 1.8 lakhs or so, the Surface, uh, with a GPU, and I use R. But you can choose any of those. And uh, you can get going yourself, so you don't need to attend a big course and so on. Hmm? Uh, uh, a little word, I wanted to do a general knowledge test, and I wish I would succeed. Where does the word algorithm come from? Who's, who had gave the correct word? Correct, sir. Not even, I think in this whole audience, maybe two will know. It is named after Muhammad Algorithmi. He was a teacher in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Okay? And uh, where is the word algebra come from? Algebra. Correct. Yeah. Are you a professor? Are you a professor? No, I'm just interested in yeah. oh, it. Yeah. It, 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 it uh, comes from the Arabic word al-jabr to mean balance. Okay? And the, there is, Algorithm himself has written a book acknowledging that he calls acknowledgement the role of Hindus. At the time, India was known as Hindus. Huh? And uh, his book contains lots of references to what he called Hindu mathematics. And this was in the 12th century. And when the Ottomans, uh, he was teaching at the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which existed where, I might say, wild animals were wandering away, Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge to you know? Wild animals, when the House of Wisdom in Baghdad was operating. And uh, I, what they did is when the Ottomans conquered Europe, this book, which was in Arabic, uh, uh, books were taken into and taught in some schools in Spain, where they converted it to Latin and algebra and all of that related areas went to Europe. So in, if you mind, instinctively, if you're an Indian, algebra should come naturally to you. Many of them, <laughs> just part of your birthright. Okay, I'll end my talk with recommending some books. The right extreme is a shameless plug of my own book called Wave Rider, but these are worth looking at. I spoke about the emerging area of network science. Uh, feel free to take pictures of this one. Uh, there's a very good book by Barabasi, Matchmakers, the multi-sided platforms and the economics and how to make it work. Uh, I am a great book admirer of R, the programming language, but arguing between R and Python, it's like saying, you know, who is uh, caramel custard better than something ice cream. Both are good, huh? But I take to R for a variety of reasons. Um, deep learning cookbook, neural networks in R. Similar books exist in Python as well, don't worry. Um, and that is my own book. So, thank you very much. Thank you.